Good morning, church. Morning, morning. This morning, we're going to try something different. I'm going to take a video of myself and all of us. So if you want to look good in my video, please smile. I'm a Christian. Of course, I come to church every Sunday and I bring my family to church. And this is my family. I am a Christian. Of course, I can memorize many Bible verses. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. I am a Christian. Of course, I can play many, many musical instruments. Okay, but that's not really me. I am a Christian. Of course, I read my Bible and I pray every day. You know, for those who don't know what that video is, Watch out for my Instagram and you will see yourself appearing there. (laughs) As Christians, there's a list of do and don'ts. And we have so many of this, of course I do this, of course I do that. But then, what really matters when we stand before Jesus? What really matters as we stand before Jesus on Judgment Day? There are many disciplines as Christians and they are great, of course. However, when He comes again, what does, he look at? what does Jesus look at? What distinguishes us as true followers of Jesus Christ? And this morning, we're going to look at Jesus as our judging Messiah in Matthew chapter 25. But before that, let's rewind a bit in chapter 24. In chapter 24, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him privately, Jesus, Jesus, tell me, when are you going to come again? And what are the signs that were and will be around your coming. And here, Jesus taught on it. But then at the end of the verse, or the chapter, he emphasized in verse 42 to 44, he emphasized that his return will be unexpected. And therefore, keep watch and be ready. And then, subsequently, he went to the next four parables to tell us, to teach us as disciples to be ready. And this parable teaches on watching, on waiting, and being prepared for his second coming. He mentioned about the two kinds of servants. He mentioned about the ten virgins. He mentioned about the parable of the gold, or parable of the talents. And finally, the fourth is the final judgment, the separation between the sheep and goats. All of this parable teaches us, as his disciples today, how to remain faithful and get ready for Jesus' inevitable and sudden coming. Let's hear God's word together this morning. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? 
Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. God, even as we come into your word this morning, even as we look into this parable, help us to listen with our ears, but to listen with our hearts also. And only just know it in our heads, but that God, your word will go deep into our hearts and will transform our hearts even as we hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we see from this first part of the parable itself that Jesus, that the judging Messiah separates. The judging Messiah separates. Jesus, when Jesus comes again, he will make a distinction between all people. You know, this parable begins with the term, the son of man, which is the same son of man that appears in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. And in Daniel, this son of man receives the kingdom from the ancient days, from the ancient of days, and he was given full authority, all the glory and the sovereign power. And this son of man is a messianic title, and he shows Jesus' divinity. And Jesus will return here. Jesus will return as a judging Messiah on his glorious throne with all authority, with all glory, and with all power to establish an everlasting kingdom. And as Jesus returns, there will be a gathering of all nations. You see, the Greek word here for all the nations is the word ethne. And it does not mean nations as we understand it to be. It does not mean Singapore, Malaysia, China, America, etc., etc. But here, the word ethne refers to people groups, all people groups. So here, the gathering involves everyone from all nations. All people will gather before the judging Messiah. There will be a massive gathering of all people from all nations, all tribes, from all times, will be gathered before Jesus. And it's, the gathering comes, as everyone is gathered, a separation occurs here. Here we see there will be a distinction made between the sheep and the goats. And although in the cultures around Israel, Israel the culture, or at least around the Jews, they don't mix sheep and goats. They normally have it separate. But for the Israelites, it's a common practice to have their sheep and goat mixed together. And therefore, there's a need for separation here. The word, the, the animal sheep, is a consistent image in the Bible to refer to the people of God. Whether it refers to Israel, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, 10, verse 6, 15, verse 24, or to Jesus' disciple in Matthew 10, 16, or 13, 7. And then, on contrast, the goat do not occur much in the New Testament, but 70% of the time when it appears in the Old Testament is referenced to their use as animal sacrifice, such as sin sacrifice or the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16 and 26. So we see here that there's this separation that happens, there's this distinction that happens between the sheep and the goat. And the sheep goes to the right side of Jesus and the goat goes to the left. And if you know more, on the right side of Jesus is a place of honour. On Jesus' right side is a place of honour. And therefore, in contrast here, the left is a place of, dis of dishonour. So the principle from the first few verses is very simple. Or at least what we learn about Jesus' coming. Jesus will return to judge everyone. And he will separate us, separate everyone to his left and to his right. But then you might ask me, how does Jesus separate? What is the criteria which the judging Messiah will judge us? We go on in the next part of the parable, in verse 34 to 45, we see the judging criteria. As Jesus separates them, the both party responded with surprise. They say, when? When did we do what you say we did? When did we do these things to you? Or the other party, the goats will say, when did we not do these things uh, to you? So they both responded, both parties responded with surprise. And if you really take a step back, you think about this surprise. This surprise shows they do not recall doing any of this directly to Jesus. They didn't think that they were doing directly to Jesus. And it also further shows 
that they were not intentionally doing these things to gain access into God's kingdom. They were not doing it on purpose so that they get the reward of being in heaven. In this case, their action or their non-action in this case for the goods are evidence of their faith, whether their faith is genuine or not. And in this evidence, we see that the sheep and goats were presented the evidence of their love towards Jesus. One group fed Jesus, gave him something to drink, visited him, clothed him, and took care of him. And the other group did not do any of this. It's interesting to note that both parties called Jesus Lord. Correct? Both the sheep and the goat called Jesus Lord. They definitely had the head knowledge that Jesus is who he said he is. He's the Lord. But there is no evidence for the goat that they lift out their faith as compared to the sheep. Here is their actions that distinguish this separation. It's their action that is the evidence that distinguish how they got separated to the left and on the right. It's like litmus test. I'm sure most of us know what a litmus test is. A litmus test determines whether a solution is alkaline or acidic based on the color that it appears after you dip it in. So in some sense, the litmus test is like our action. All our action is like the litmus test. It acts as an evidence to see whether our faith is genuine or not. But please note, okay, that the litmus test doesn't change the nature of the solution. It doesn't make it more alkaline or more acidic because it, the solution remains the same. It merely shows the pH level. And same as our actions, it does not change the existence of our faith. But it proves the accident, uh, ex that whether our faith exists or not. It proves the existence of our faith. The point is clear. It's not that because we are saved, because of, we are saved because of our deeds. It's because we are saved, do we even want and able to love and serve others. Your actions are evidence of your saving faith, not a means of salvation. Note here that only Jesus can judge when he returns. On this part, on our side, we can never know whether someone's faith is genuine or not. Only the judging Messiah knows. Therefore, I do not want us to go after this sermon itself to go and start judging, hey, this person maybe is not a Christian or this person his faith is not genuine. We don't want to go out and judge after hearing this sermon. And in, our, in this hall, I'm sure all of us know Christians who have grown lukewarm, whose behavior or their actions, current actions may not show that they are really following Jesus. It may be your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your loved ones, and in some of us, friends, who have grown up together with us in church. I want to encourage us, I want to encourage you, don't lose heart. Keep praying, keep trusting God and pray that they will come back to God and God will draw them back to Himself. God will draw these people back to Himself and keep them in sh as sheep and keep them faithful all the way to the end. We move on and we see then in response to their surprise, Jesus responded to that also. Truly I say to you, as you did to it to the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Here we see the list of these my brothers. And the list of these refers to those that are needy, those that are vulnerable, those who have later status, and those who have different needs. But then the question comes out, who? Who is this, my brothers? Or in NIV case, and sisters. Who are these, my brothers, that Jesus was referring to? So in this, my brothers, there are five interpretations that surfaces. And majority of the scholars or majority of the uh, biblical teachers are of the view that it's either refer to all humanity or all believers. And in my research, when I was reading, when I was flipping through the Bible, I believe that when Jesus mentions my brother here, in the book of Matthew, he was referring to all believers. As the Greek word elder force is used in other parts of Matthew 
So when we read the book of Matthew, we've got to take a step back and see how this word is being used by Matthew in other parts of the book itself. And it refers to Jesus' disciples. In 547, 1248 to 49, 1815 to 17, 23 verse 8, 28 verse 10, every of these instances when the word elder force is being used, it refers to Jesus' disciple. And therefore, it refers when in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus was referring to all believers. So therefore, Jesus is calling us to care for the needy believers around us. He wants real love to surround his believers. And this is exactly what love surround means. To love all those in our community, especially those in need. To love all those in our community. But please take a note. Uh, note, okay, we also want to take a step back out of the book of Matthew and look at the biblical meta narrative. This does not absolve a general mercy that we as Christians must, must do to those in need. But here in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, that is not the emphasis. In the biblical narrative, we are called to care for all who in need. We see in Proverbs chapter 14 and chapter 19 that we were told that to ignore the needs of a poor man is to sin against the Lord. Other passages include the calls for social justice. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 7, 1 to 17, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, Michael 6, 8, and other, many other verses. And here, I want to present us a good guiding principle from the Apostle Paul. He says, So then, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. So this is a good guiding principle that we can have to do good to everyone, especially to those in the household of faith. As followers of Jesus, we need to have the three H, the head, the heart, and the hands. The head knowledge to know Jesus, to know the gospel, to accept Jesus as our Saviour and Lord, to know and study God's word accurately and actively. There is the head knowledge. Then the heart, the heart of love. We see both parties in this parable. They had the knowledge of Jesus. Like I mentioned, they called Jesus Lord. And when they called Jesus as Lord, but the group on the left lacks the heart transformation and the hand application. They did not leave out this head knowledge that they have of Jesus as Lord in their hearts and in their hands. So having both knowledge and love needs to be transformed into action. And this parable shows very clearly the action acts as evidence of their head and heart knowledge of the Lord. Allow me to quote from Elder Ron, who preached at Frontline a few years ago. He said this, God's love language is obedience. God's love language is obedience. God wants us to obey His Word and to live it out. And obedience is not just merely knowing God's Word in our heads. Obedience is truth applied in our lives. Obedience is applying what you know in your head, in your heart, through your hands. The head knowledge of the gospel needs to be traveled vertically from the head down to the hearts. And it's being trans traveled down to the hearts you need to travel horizontally to our hands to serve and to love others. And isn't this the greatest commandment that Jesus just spoke about three chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 22? The greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. The greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. And as we stand accountable before the judgment, judging Messiah on Judgment Day. We need to stand with our head knowledge, our hearts in love, and our hands in actions, in action. Allow me to share some story of our members who serve to meet the needs of others. Last year, we had a youth mission trip. And of course, when we go, there's some cost involved. And there was a parent who found out that there are some youths who need financial assistance and they offered to give generously towards the fund to subsidize 
these youths. Just hear yourself, our sign language translator, serving faithfully every week to interpret for the deaf community. They're really serving a real need in our community. Recently, I just spoke to a church member and found out they've been using their van to ferry wheelchair-bound elderly to church regularly. And this couple decided to buy a van instead of a car so that they can serve this real need. And I'm going to quote this person. This person said, and I'm going to quote him, we are saved to be his children and we are to live out his goodness in us so that the one receive, the one who receives our goodness may glorify our Father. Indeed, blessed to be a blessing. We have many faithful KJ teachers also that we hear about ferrying children to and fro churches, to and fro body because they have needs and they can't travel to church by themselves. We have KJ teachers doing library runs for children. I even hear, we even hear of a youth, uh, uh, a member, who opened up their homes to welcome youths from broken families so that these youths feel the love of a family. In our young adults, we have young adult DGs visiting members who couldn't leave their homes during COVID period. All the way up in our kingdom treasures, there are so many faithful members who visit elderly in hospitals, in their homes. Some even serve the practical need of ferrying them to and fro hospitals. We even hear of families who loan their vehicles to families for a short period of time to serve a certain need. And the list goes on. I can keep going on with different, and all of us know different things. And we are very grateful for every single one of these role models who have actively served and lived out their faith through their actions. And even though we may not know who they are, we may not personally know some of them, but I just want to encourage them and let us all applause and thank them for what they are doing. Brothers and sisters, decide now to follow and to love Jesus in your head, in your heart, and in your hands. Make a choice to serve those among us who have needs. Ask God this morning, this afternoon, to open up your physical eyes and your spiritual eyes to look out for those in need. And even as you see those in need, ask the Lord to reveal and to move your hands to serve. Pray and ask God to lead you to an opportunity to serve others in a tangible way. Finally, in verse 34, 41 and 46, here Jesus gives the judgment. He announces the verdict of the both parties. Jesus states the reward in 34 is to receive the inheritance which is the kingdom of God. And this reward is given. It's not earned by those. It's not earned by our own effort. It's a gift of their relationship with Christ. And the reward is to able to continue and enjoy Jesus for all eternity. And in contrast, eternal fire awaits those on the left. And as they, as they did not demonstrate mercy to Jesus through the least of this, here they're called to depart from Jesus. They're called to leave His presence they do not have the privilege to be with Jesus anymore in eternity. Last week, we learned from Pastor Ma that Jesus is the teaching Messiah and he expects us to live out his teachings. This morning, Jesus is being presented as the judging Messiah. And most of the time, we don't like to view Jesus as the Messiah or the judging Messiah. But the fact is that if Jesus, if Jesus teach, he will judge. If Jesus teach, he will judge. It's like us studying in education. There will be exams to test whether we have been applying the knowledge we learn. Therefore, on Judgment Day, we will be judged on whether we are following the teaching of a Messiah. And there is either eternal reward or eternal punishment that awaits us. And we read in Romans chapter 2 that we stand before Jesus and we are no, there is no excuse as we stand before Jesus in judgment. 
In this parable, we see the certainty of his return, the separation, the judgment, and the consequences. There are no in-betweens. There are no in-between consequences. You either get the reward or you get the punishment. The sheep on the right will continue to enjoy eternal life, but the goat on the left will go into eternal punishment. Therefore, with this certainty that is being presented, we need to live today with this expectation of this certainty. This certainty ought to affect our present reality and transform our head, our hearts, our hands as we prepare ourselves for Judgment Day. Church, brothers and sisters, let's not wait until that day and only find out that you're on the wrong side. For me, that is one of the worst fears for myself as a believer. To know Jesus, to think that I know Jesus all my life, and I call him Lord all my life, and then on Judgment Day, I'm being placed on the side for the goods. And there is no return at that point. And this morning, as your pastor, I don't want to see this happen to any single one of us. I want to see everyone that I know in God's community. I want to see every believer standing on the right side of Jesus. Call him Lord and to live out according to that. And this parable given here is a warning here. It's a warning for us to call, to insert this litmus test of faith into our lives and to see whether our faith is genuine. This parable is a call for us to serve those among us who have needs and to go the extra mile to love, to let love surround our community. Make a choice today that you want to be on Jesus' right side and live according to that choice. Allow me to end with this quote from Wesley Olmsted. He says, Final judgment will reveal the true character of a person which only God can know at present. One actions reflects one identity and basic allegiance. An allegiance to Jesus as God's Messiah and so obedient to his teaching will be the basis of judgment. Let me repeat the last line. An allegiance to Jesus as God's Messiah and so obedient to his teaching will be the basis of judgment. Allegiance to the judging Messiah is revealed in our, heart, in our heads, in our hearts, and through our hands. This afternoon, I want to call, I want to give a call for us to respond and to pledge your allegiance to our Messiah. Don't wait until Judgment Day. Don't wait until the moment when Jesus returns as it may be too late. So there are two groups of people that I want to speak to this morning, this afternoon. The first group, you're very sure of your allegiance. Great, praise God. Continue to declare and to live out your allegiance to Christ. Continue to live it, live out according to their allegiance. And on that day, we can be on the right side of Jesus together when he returns. The second group are those that are unsure of your allegiance to Christ. I want to challenge you this morning. Stop living as a nominal Christian. Stop playing church. Stop playing religion. And live as a Christian with head, heart and hands. At Judgment Day, some of us might call Jesus Lord, Lord. But he may say to us, depart from me, I never knew you. As you hear the message this morning, and you're sitting there in your seats, and you're thinking, Pastor John, that may be me. But I want to respond today. I want to respond this moment. I want to stop playing church. I want to respond and pledge and declare my allegiance to Christ. I want to be serious with Jesus. I want to stop being a nominal Christian. So if that's you, 
I want to call, I want to challenge you to respond to Jesus today and not wait. You don't want to wait until judgment day, then you think back and you realize on 10th of March 2024, I heard this message and I didn't respond. But then now I'm on the wrong side. Don't wait until that moment. Make a choice today to pledge your allegiance to Christ. The Bible says, today, if you hear God's word, do not harden your heart. Respond to Him today if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And if you belong to either of this group, I want, us, I want to challenge you to stand as we sing the closing song. And don't just stand because the person on your left or your right is standing. Don't just stand because we are in church. We are in God's presence. Stand and declare and pledge your allegiance to Christ. Stand because you want to declare your allegiance to Jesus today. You want to know Jesus in your head. You want to love Jesus in your heart. You want to serve Jesus with your hands. And you want to enjoy Jesus for all eternity. So if that's you, let's stand as we sing this closing song. Wherever you are, even for those worshipping online, let's stand and respond and declare your allegiance to Christ.